Hey everyone, let's go over all 71 built-in Python functions. Well, technically some of them aren't functions, some of them are types, like bool, but these are the things that you don't have to install, you don't even have to import them, they're just global names that are available that you can call. So whether you're brand new to Python and just want to see what's available, or you're more of an intermediate and just need a refresher on memory view, let's get going. First up, we have math built-ins. I'm talking about types like bool, int, float, and complex as well as the math utilities, max, min, divmod, abs, pow, round, and sum. Bool is the built-in type whose only values are true and false. When you use it like a function, its purpose is to convert a value to true or false. For instances of your own classes, you can define what bool does by defining a dunder bool method. Next up we have int, the built-in integer type. When you use it as a function, its purpose is to convert its argument, like this string123, into an integer123. For your classes, you can define what it means to convert to an integer by defining a dunder int function. Next up, float, which is just like int, but for floating point numbers. You can define how your own classes convert to float with dunder float. Then we come to complex, Python's built-in complex number type. This does the exact same thing as using Python's built-in complex literal. And note, Python uses the letter j for the imaginary unit. For your own types, you can use dunder complex to define how to convert to a complex number. And on to the functions. First up we have max and min. Given something like this list of numbers, max will give you the largest number, and min will give you the smallest one. It works with tuples, sets, dictionaries, or any iterable. Instead of using an iterable, you can also use the multi-argument forms when you have a fixed number of arguments. Next up we have divmod. If you're ever doing a calculation where you're separately computing the quotient and remainder, you can do so more efficiently by using divmod. Then we have abs, which gives you the absolute value of a number. And for complex numbers, it gives you the magnitude, which is the distance to the origin. You can define a dunder abs to customize what abs does for your types. Next up we have pow, which does the same thing as the built-in power operator. Pow also takes an optional third argument for the modulus. This does the exact same thing as taking 2 to the power 3 and then taking that mod 5. This turns out to be much more efficient if your exponent is really big. And you guessed it, you can customize pow for your own classes using dunder pow. Next up, round, which can be used to round to a certain number of decimal places. But be careful, due to floating point rounding errors, rounding using Python may not give you the same answer as rounding like you learned in school. You can also round to a negative number of places to clear out lower powers of 10. And of course, use dunderround to customize what round does for your classes. Then we have sum, which can be used to add up elements in an arbitrary iterable. It's also commonly used to count occurrences of how many elements satisfy some predicate by summing 1 for all the things that match some condition. You can customize sum by customizing what plus does using dunder add. And that does it for math, on to collections. I'm talking about dict, list, tuple, set, and frozen set. All of these are types, not functions. Dict creates a built-in dictionary type. More commonly, you would do this with the dictionary literal syntax, though. Next up is list, which is used to convert something into a list. Tuples are just like lists, except you cannot modify them. The benefit of doing this, of course, is that tuples can be used in sets and as keys of dictionaries, whereas lists cannot. Set is used to create an instance of the built-in set type. The typical reason for doing so is, of course, to remove duplicates. You can also create a set with the built-in set literal syntax. Frozen sets, on the other hand, have no literal syntax. A frozen set is just like a set, except it can't be mutated, similar to how a tuple is just like a list, but it can't be mutated. Moving on to our third category, functions that have to do with strings and bytes. This includes the types, bytes, byte array, string, and memory view, as well as open, chur, ord, bin, oct, hex, format, input, ascii, and repr. First up is bytes that's used to construct the bytes object, which can also be constructed using the literal bytes syntax. A bytes object acts a lot like a tuple of integers between 0 and 255. However, because of their primary use case, bytes also contain many convenience functions that make them act like strings or to convert to and from strings. Next up we have the byte array type, which is just like bytes, except it's mutable. Then we come to good old string. This is Python's built-in string type, you use it as a function to convert anything to a string. Unlike in some lower level languages, Python's string type assumes that you're using Unicode encoding. That's why in Python it's perfectly fine to paste a literal smiley face into your code. And now we come to memory view, one that I think a lot of you have probably never used before. The memory view type is Python's way of allowing you to access raw bytes as if it was a multi-dimensional array. Here we're supplying the raw bytes by hand, but more often this is used by a C extension type using the buffer protocol. In this case, the bytes represent four integers, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
We pass it to memory view and use cast to tell Python that these should be treated as integers with a 2x2 two two shape. From then on, we can use the memory view as if it's a 2x2 two two array. Next we have open, which of course opens a file for reading or writing depending on the parameters you pass in. Of course, we should prefer to use open with a width statement so that the file is automatically closed when we leave the width block. Next up we have the pair of inverse functions chur and ord. Chur takes an integer and gives you the corresponding ASCII character. Then ord does the opposite, it takes the character and gives you back the integer. And technically we're not limited to ASCII here, we can use any Unicode code point. Then we have bin, oct, and hex, which are convenience functions to give you string representations of a number in that certain format, either binary, octal, or hexadecimal. You can actually reverse this operation and get the integer 42 back by passing in the base that was used in the string representation as the second argument to the built-in int. Next up, we have format, which is a little bit of a tricky one. It's related, but not quite the same as the dot .format method on a string, or more commonly, fstrings. Instead of just putting a variable here, I can actually put a format specifier afterwards. For instance, colon x after the age will cause it to print out in hexadecimal instead of decimal. Well, the built-in format function is what does that conversion. Format of 31 gives the string 31. But format of 31 with the format specifier x gives 1f. If you want to define how this works for your own types, which will work with format as well as with these format specifiers inside fstrings and dot .format, then define a dunder format function to create format specs for your own types. Next up, the built-in input function. This pauses your program and waits for the user to enter input at the terminal. And when they hit enter, you get back whatever they typed as a string. Next up, ASCII and wrapper. The original idea behind wrapper was that if you typed in the string that wrapper returns, then that would give you something equivalent to the original object. But in modern day, it's kind of just a more verbose string conversion. ASCII does the same thing, it just calls wrapper, but it ensures that the output only uses ASCII characters by escaping if necessary. And that brings us to all the functions that have to do with iteration. We've got iter, next, enumerate, zip, reversed, sorted, filter, map, all, any, range, slice, and the async ones, a iter and a next. Iter takes any iterable, like a list, and it returns an iterator, where an iterator is just something that you can call next on. Each time you call next, it gives you the next element of the iteration. A regular old for loop in Python is the normal way you use them. Under the hood, it calls iter and next for you. And then we have enumerate, which allows you to get the index of each item as you iterate over them. So if I start with red, green, blue, then when I iterate, I'll get pairs 0, red, 1, green, 2, blue. But the normal way that you would use this is just in a for loop where you destructure the index and the thing as you loop over them. Zip, on the other hand, allows you to loop over corresponding elements from different collections. So if I zip together 1, 2, 3, and A, B, C, then I'll get out 1A, 2B, 3C. And of course, the normal way that you would use this is just by immediately destructuring the elements in a for loop. And then we have reversed, which allows you to loop over a sequence in reverse order. You can customize what reversed means for your class with Dunder reversed. And here's an unexpected tidbit. Reversed actually works on a dictionary, so in addition to the first element, which is easy to get, you can also access the last element efficiently. And then there's sorted. It returns a sorted copy of whatever you pass in. The result of sorted is always a list though, no matter what you pass in. Then we have filter, which can be used to skip certain elements depending on whether or not they satisfy a certain condition. In this case, we take the numbers one to 10, and the condition we give is this function that checks the number is even. For efficiency, filter doesn't return a list. You can iterate over it without ever making this list copy. Personally though, I much prefer using a list comprehension with a guard clause instead of using filter. Map, on the other hand, applies its function to each element. So if we start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and give it this lambda, which squares a single element, then we get the squares 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. Once again, we had to manually convert this to a list because map is lazy by default. And once again, I much prefer using a list comprehension as a more readable alternative. Next up, we have all and any. Both of these take in an iterable and tell you whether all or any of the elements in the iterable are truthy. It's pretty intuitive, except you do need to get used to what happens in the empty case. All of nothing is true, but any of nothing is false. And that brings us to hopefully a very familiar one, range. A range represents all the numbers in a given range. Of course, the normal way that you use a range is just by immediately looping over it in a for loop. And note that like many other iteration tools in Python, ranges are lazy. And then we come to slice, which is something that you would rarely ever actually type out, but you do use pretty often. 
This 1 colon 4 is kind of like using a slice literal, except it's not really a slice literal. You can't assign a variable to 1 colon 4. The way this would typically get used is when you're defining your get item inside of a class, you can check if the item that you got was a slice and then do something different in that case. And just like the literal syntax, you can also provide a step parameter to slice as well. And that brings us to async iteration, a iter and a next. It's totally analogous to iter and next. You call a iter on something in order to get an asynchronous iterator to it. And the only thing you can do with an asynchronous iterator is call await a next on it. Each time you await a next, you get the next element of the iterator. And just like normal iterators, you don't normally call a iter or a next. Instead, it all happens automatically when you do an async for loop. Our next category is debugging and interactivity. Just three things here, breakpoint, help, and print. Calling breakpoint will pause the Python program and drop you into a debugger. Now this is going to be a command line debugger, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you really need to do this. Your IDE probably has a much better GUI debugger built in that you don't have to modify your code in order to use. Help, um, prints out help text. And print, I can't imagine you don't know this one if you've made it this far into the video, but at the very least, maybe you didn't know that print has a file parameter? Anyway, moving on to our next category, object inspection and modification. Here we have the base object type, all the adders, get adder, set adder, del adder, has adder. We have dir, id, hash, length, is instance, is subclass, callable, and super and type. You can't do much with a base object instance, but there is one common use case, and that's using an object as a sentinel. The only purpose of a sentinel is that you can check whether something is or is not the sentinel. If I didn't care too much, I could just use get with no default parameter and then check if the value that I get is none, and that would indicate that the value wasn't in the map. But maybe none is a meaningful value for me, and I want to know whether I got none in the map or whether it wasn't in the map. In that case, I can use the sentinel as the default value, and then if the value that I got back is the sentinel, then the value wasn't in there. This sentinel trick can be used anytime you need a value that is guaranteed to have never been used before. You just created it, so there's no way anybody else is using it. And that brings us to get adder, set adder, del adder, and has adder. Let's say we define a class that has some attribute, and we create an instance of the class. Of course, I can access the value of the attribute by saying instance.attribute. But doing it this way, I have to know attribute ahead of time. What if I wanted to use a variable to determine which attribute to look up, instead of always looking up dot attribute? Well, that's exactly what get adder does. Here, I've typed in attribute, but that could have been a variable. And just like get on a dictionary, get adder can also be used with a default. Set adder is a similar story. I can say instance dot new attribute and give it a value. If I want to use a variable to determine which attribute to set, then instead I can use set adder. Then if I want to check if an instance has a certain attribute, of course that's what has adder does. And del adder is the equivalent for deleting attributes. Another way that you can check what attributes are available is using dir. Now dir is very much meant to be a convenience function. It is not guaranteed to be correct or complete. For that reason, I basically never use it. But in theory, it could be useful for some kind of type that lazily generates attributes as you ask for them. Next up, we've got ID, which tells you the unique identity of an object. Every object in Python is given a number that uniquely differentiates it from all other objects in Python. It could be reused after the object dies, but as long as the object is alive, that number remains stable and you can use it to check whether an object is the same as some other object. For instance, we can determine that this hello is literally the identical object as this hello by comparing their identities and seeing they're equal. Whereas if I create two sets that both contain one, two, three, Yes, they're equal, but no, they are not literally the same object. Normally though, if you just wanted to know whether or not two things are the same object, you would use the is or is not operator. Under the hood, is and is not just compare the IDs. But sometimes it can be useful to keep track of objects by their ID. For instance, if you're traversing a graph of nodes, you can keep track of which ones you've already seen by keeping a set of the IDs. The hash built in gives you the hash of an object. It's an integer that's used in hash table or hash set based implementations of dictionaries or sets. I'm definitely not going to do justice to the idea of a hash table in this video, but suffice it to say that using hashes allows you to look up a single object in a huge collection without traversing the entire collection. Uh, length tells you the length. And then we have is instance and is subclass. Now every object in Python has a type. And unlike some languages, you can actually access that type information at runtime. 
You can say, if someone gives me an int, do one thing. If someone gives me a string, do something else. But your first instinct of using type and checking whether you get a particular value is probably not what you want. In most cases, your code should operate the same if someone passes a subclass instead of the parent class. What is instance literally does is look at the method resolution order of the value and check if int is in it. So this check will pass if value is an int or a subclass of an int or a subclass of a subclass of an int and so on. And fun fact, in Python, booleans are integers. Is subclass does something completely analogous to is instance, but it operates on the classes themselves, not on instances. Then we have callable, which tells you whether something is or isn't a callable in Python. Functions are callables, classes are callables, methods are callables, but a string is not callable. Next we have super. Super actually returns a proxy object that when you access one of its attributes, it looks up the attribute from whoever's next in line in the object's method resolution order. That can be really complex if you're using multiple inheritance, but for single inheritance, that just means grab this from my parent class. And the last one in this group is type, which actually has two separate uses. The first we've already seen, type of some object tells you what the type of the object is. But type can actually be used in a completely separate way, which is to create a new type. Give it a name, its base classes, and its class dictionary, and Python will dynamically create a new type that has those parameters. This is definitely not the normal way to create a type, the normal way is to use the class keyword. Then we come to the three descriptors, class method, property, and static method. Now these are the sneakiest ones because you don't normally call them with open close paren. You normally use them as decorators. Let's talk about property first. It's what allows you to quote, own the dot in Python. What that means is that in Python, when you say instance.value, you can actually change what that means, because in this case, value is a property, it calls this function. This setter here allows me to then control what instance.value equals something does. The next two are very similar, class method and static method. Class method and static method both allow you to call the method on either an instance or the class itself. If you used class method, then Python will automatically provide the class as the first argument, whereas if you used static method, then it won't provide a class argument. The main difference of why you would choose one over the other is what you want to happen if someone inherits from this class. If someone inherits from my class and they call this class method, the value for class will be the child class. Whereas in the static method, I don't have access to the class that this was called from. So if I wanted to access other class attributes or call other class functions, I would have to do so by name, which is going to use the parent class's behavior or the parent class's attribute, even if this was being called from a child class. And finally, we come to the last category, dynamic features. These things are extremely powerful, usually not what you want, and very easy to misuse. I'm talking about eval, exec, compile, globals, locals, vars, and dunder import. Eval takes a string representation of an expression and evaluates it as code. This string contains the variable x, and there's this variable x that's in our current scope, so when we evaluate the expression, that value of x is used. And next up is a very similar flavored one, exec. Eval evaluated and returned a single expression. Exec, on the other hand, can run multiple statements and it doesn't return anything. The first step of execing a string is to compile it first, so if you are execing something many times, you might want to pre-compile it by using compile. Then we have globals, which gives you access to the global module dictionary. The return value is the real dictionary that the current module is using for its globals. So if you modify it in the dictionary, it actually changes real global variables. Locals gives you a dictionary of all of the local variables in the current function, but unlike globals, you're not allowed to modify it. Then we have vars, which gives you the underlying dunder dict of an object. And very last, we have another one that you probably shouldn't be using, dunder import. If I dunder import math, then the result is the real math module. I can call math.square root on 16 and get 4. However, dunder import has all kinds of extra options that you probably don't want to mess with. For instance, this one is like doing a from spam.ham import eggs and sausage. Typically when you're importing, you just use the import statement, of course. But even in the case where the module that you might want to be importing comes from a variable, if all you want to do is import the module, then you should much prefer to use import lib. Basically, it's just a much more user-friendly, harder to mess up version than Dunder import. And that's it, that's all of them. So let me know down below how many of them you already knew about and which one's your favorite.
Thanks for watching, and thank you to my patrons and donors for their support. See you in the next one.